uh, thanks for joining us for our, our latest uh, COVID update Q&A. Uh, today, our panelists are uh, UAB Division Director of Infectious Diseases, Dr. Jeannie Marazzo, and Dr. David Kimberlin, Co-Director of UAB and Children's of Alabama's Division of Pedi Pediatric Infectious Diseases. Um, today, they'll be providing some, some general COVID updates, uh, what to expect with the, the BA5 subvariant of Omicron, uh, information for parents as, as children return to school and, and some other questions that you may have. Uh, as a reminder, we are recording this session and we'll provide a copy uh, shortly following. Um, to start, uh, I think Dr. Marazzo and Dr. Kimberlin are going to provide some, some opening remarks. So Dr. Marazzo, we'll start with you and then we'll go to Dr. Kimberlin. Sure. Thanks, Adam. And thanks to you all for being here to hear a quick update on what's going on with the COVID situation. Um, right now, uh, we are in an upswing or what I would call another surge. And I think if you are talking to anybody, you know someone probably who has COVID right now or who has had COVID in the last couple of weeks. It seems like cases are coming at us thick and fast. And not just that, we're seeing a lot of cases in people who have managed to avoid clinical symptoms of COVID throughout the whole pandemic. So a number of people who are like, I've managed to dodge the bullet um, until now and I have COVID. And I think there are a few reasons for that. If you look at the composition of the variants that are behind this current wave, over 85% is an Omicron variant called BA5. Um, there's a little bit of BA4 out there, but it's almost all BA5. And the really tricky part about BA5 is it's probably the most infectious COVID variant that we have seen so far. You may have heard stories about friends who've been really careful, they've been wearing masks, they happened to take their mask off for a quick, quick trip in the car, or they were at a wedding and they ate dinner with people and they came down with COVID. The bar to prevent transmission of BA5 is just much higher. There's no question you can prevent it with very good masks, um, N95s, KN95s, but the diligence, the persistence, and the consistency of mask wearing, and probably also being thoughtful about how you are in a close space, what's the ventilation like, all those things have come back into play in sort of considering the risk for BA5. So it's definitely more infectious. The other thing about BA5 is something that we have expected to happen and unfortunately has happened over time is that the evolving variants continue to uh, adapt to the vaccines and the protection that the vaccines have been so good at um, giving us. The vaccines that are currently available are still active against the current variant, the BA5, the BA4 variants of Omicron, but they're not protecting against infection or acquisition of the virus as well as they did previous strains. They are still working to prevent severe disease. And one thing I would point out is that even though our numbers are high, in fact, Alabama is number five in the US if you look at cases per capita, and there's a whole other issue with how you count cases, which we can come back to if you like, um, we're still not seeing the surge in hospitalizations and deaths that were associated with previous waves. So even though people are getting it, they're getting sick, classic sore throat, cough, um, fever, some people are getting chills, a little bit less, probably in terms of loss of smell and taste, which is a good thing, a little bit less pneumonia, we're really not seeing the kinds of hospitalization rates that we saw before. Our census here at UAB has been stable for the last month. In Alabama at large, we have about 850 people who are hospitalized, well below our horrible surge of over 3,000 when we were dealing with um, the earlier waves, and that was our max. So I think that the news overall is pretty good. The really big question is, um, is Paxlovid, which we know is now the pill to treat COVID, um, who should get it? Should everybody get it? Is Paxlovid rebound a real thing? That is, you stop taking Paxlovid after five days, you get sick again, it's definitely a real thing. And we can talk about that if people have questions. 
And then what's the future um, for vaccines in the fall? And I'll just say something very briefly about that and then turn it over to Dr. Kimberl and he may wanna comment on that too, as well as the issues for kids. We think that in a week or two, we should hear more from CDC and possibly FDA about what to expect for the fall. I'm pretty sure, although, you know, always surprises in this pandemic and with this virus, that the recommendation is going to include a vaccine that will involve what's called the prototype strain, so sort of the basic coronavirus, but then a component that is specific for BA4 and 5. Good news about 4 and 5 is that they are incredibly similar in terms of what you need to do to make a vaccine. So this vaccine will be definitely updated to reflect um, at least what's going on right now. The wild card is by the time the vaccine is out there, is BA4, BA5 going to be the dominant variant? And whatever is out there, is it going to be protected against by the new vaccine? So that's what to expect. Um, and I'll stop there and turn it over to Dr. Kimball and to give his uh, background. Well, I, uh, I thank you all as well for taking time out of a busy morning to, to meet with us today to hear about uh, COVID and where we are with the COVID pandemic. I, I, I note that this is our third August to be talking about this as school approaches. Uh, I, I, would I put my money that there won't be a fourth August a year from now? No, probably not. Um, the virus is with us. It will stay with us. And therefore, we need to um, redouble our efforts to figure out how to live with this virus. That doesn't mean ignore it. That means, that means you know, really truly figuring out how to decrease our risks uh, in a way that allows us to continue with our lives. And of course, that includes returning to school. We learned in 2020 just how, how important it is for children to be in school. Uh, and I think everybody is completely on board with that. Uh, a couple of things that are, are relatively good news. I think over the past two and a half years, we have not seen, and we didn't know this to begin with, but we have not seen schools to be an epicenter of community spread. And, and, and so that, that makes me a little bit more confident as we approach the next school year, even a next school year in which many of our school systems likely will not be requiring masks. Uh, probably most will likely not be requiring masks. That's not what I advocate necessarily, but that's the reality of it. Uh, so, so I think the fact that, that they're not at least in the past and presumably not in the future, driving community spread is uh, a somewhat reassuring um, representation or, or fact that we, we should keep in mind. The other thing, uh, is, though, is that schools are not uh, you know, isolated from the community. What happens in the community will impact the school. And so as we talk through with the series of questions to come, what the um, recommendations are with respect to preventing and or doing your best to prevent infection in schools, transmitting in schools, I think you have to definitely realize that the, the community extends well beyond just the walls of that school. So what the recommendations are in the community are gonna be what the recommendation should be in schools as well. Uh, and, and, and so we might be able to provide to y'all a, a link to the CDC website that specifically um, has where you can drill down at the county levels and see where we are, not only in Alabama, but across the country, but in our cases, we focus in on what Alabama schools should be doing. The, the overwhelming majority of Alabama counties are orange slash red. That means we all, when we're indoors, should be masked. That's the reason that Dr. Morazzo and I are not in the same studio together. Uh, th this is just our reality right now. And it's what we should do until we drop back down to yellow and then hopefully you know, make it all the way back to green in terms of what our county numbers are. I'll stop with that. Happy to uh, turn it over to the media to ask questions, and, and we're here to, to answer them as best we can. All right. Thank you uh, both for those opening remarks. Um, I think the first question we'll start with is from Stephen Gallian with WAAY. Um, he asks, and I, I, I imagine this is for Dr. Marazzo, can you talk about rebound COVID cases um, and maybe what we're seeing in Alabama as it relates to those? Sure. Um, so let me start with the last part about that, what we're seeing in Alabama. In general, we don't have great surveillance data for how frequently this is happening. What I'm going to tell you is really reflective of what's 
been published in the literature so far, and also based on anecdotal experience, as I've talked with a lot of people who've had COVID and taken Paxlovid, as have my colleagues here. So if you look at the literature, you know, initially a, a month or so ago, there were several reports saying that this was really uncommon, um, that it was about 1% of people. And that was right after Dr. Fauci came out and said he had it, a couple of other prominent people. In the last couple of weeks, there have been more publications estimating that it's probably closer to 15%. So maybe one in 10 to one in five people might experience Paxlovid rebound. Now, again, these numbers are really speculative. Um, in my personal experience, I would say it's probably around that number. Um, you're seeing people who essentially take Paxlovid for five days and then they and they feel better clearly when they're on it. Usually they feel better within 24 to 48 hours, especially if they've had a fever or chills. Those tend to resolve with the Paxlovid. But then what happens is they stop taking the Paxlovid and in general, two to three days later, they start to have either a recurrence of their symptoms or some new symptoms. Usually those symptoms are not as severe, but they can be. The theory behind what's happening here is twofold. One, the five days of Paxlovid probably shuts down the virus from multiplying. So you do feel better, but it doesn't eradicate the virus. And so you still have a reservoir or a storage unit basically of the virus in your body. And when you pull off the Paxlovid, it is allowed to come back and get active again. So that's probably one component, which leads people to ask, well, shouldn't we be taking Paxlovid longer? Should we maybe take another course? Should we take it for 10 days? Excellent questions. I don't know the answers. I have recommended to people whose recurrent symptoms or rebound symptoms were very severe to restart the Paxlovid, but I have to say it's not an evidence-based recommendation. Even Dr. Fauci said that he took a, a second course uh, of Paxlovid. The other thing that's going on here that is really interesting and we really need to learn more about is a theory that if you take the Paxlovid, you're actually, actually preventing your body from mounting an immune response in the very early phase of the illness. And so when you pull the Paxlovid off, your body hasn't had a chance to make any of those early things that might have helped to dampen down the infection. There's a lot more work to be done to figure that out. Um, that said, if you are really sick or if you're in one of the higher risk groups for complications from COVID, it would not stop me from giving you or prescribing or even taking the Paxlovid uh, for the prescribed period if I really needed it. So I hope that helps. There's a lot that we don't know, but it's definitely a thing um, and people are uh, suffering from it. All right, thank you. Um, we'll go to Emily Mustner with WHNT. She has her hand raised. Go ahead, Emily. Good morning, everyone. Um, this question is probably more suited for Dr. Kimberlin. I know you mentioned that this is our third August going with going back to school. You know, you mentioned uh, could we maybe see a fourth next year? Uh, I know I'm here in North Alabama. A lot of school districts are not putting any masking. Um, rules in place. Are you concerned with, as you mentioned, you know, a lot of people being in the orange and the red categories with, with going back without any mask uh, requirements that we could see, you know, another surge, especially in children? I think parents, um, you know, their, their, their shared experience is that when children return to school, they tend to start getting more, more illnesses. Um, you know, you, you take children who kind of been spread out over summer and you put them inside uh, one or two locations, uh, and somebody with the cold is going to spread the cold. Somebody with, you know, strep throat is going to spread strep throat. That's just the nature of it. Uh, COVID will be the same. Uh, and, and and so yes, I, I am concerned when school districts uh, don't follow the CDC recommendations. Uh, I, I see no reason not to. Uh, just as I see no reason for grocery stores not to follow the the CDC recommendations or banks not to follow the CDC recommendations, we should all be doing this. Uh, if we don't, um, then we get what we get. Uh, we get more virus in our community for longer periods of time. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think the thing about public health, which is what a pandemic is, is it requires the public to do their part. And, and CDC is, is really quite clear on what that should be. They are relooking, as I understand it, uh, to see whether additional tweaks or modifications are needed. But right now you can go to the CDC website, you can drill down on your county, you can see if you're green, you're good. 
you know, live your life. If you're yellow, you're good, live your life, but be aware that there's more virus in your community and it's impacted, beginning to maybe impact the hospital bed availability. If you're orange slash red in your community, in other words, in your county, uh, then that means that there's enough virus in the community, as Dr. Morazzo said, you're probably going to know somebody who already has it, and it's putting stress on the hospital system, which, you know, kind of is where we started with all of this back in March and April of 2020, trying to protect our hospital system so we have beds to go to when we're so sick, whether we're sick with COVID or we're sick because we just had a heart attack or a stroke. Uh, and so when that is happening when your county's in red or orange, whether you're in a school or in a bank or in a grocery store or you know whatever your business is, whatever your indoor activities are, everyone vaccinated or not, boosted or not, is supposed to wear a mask uh, when they're in proximity with others. Uh, and I would recommend that. I think I think that's sound uh, advice. It's it's measurable advice. It's relatively simple advice. And in my judgment, schools are 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 well suited if they if they follow that. Now, will they? Um, I don't know. Um, I, I hope so. Um, if not, parents should realize they have a voice here and, and they can let their school superintendent and their principals know that they would prefer that the schools follow the science and follow the scientific and public health recommendations uh, and, and, and then see where that goes. You know, if enough people come together and say, we want this, generally speaking, leaders will be responsive to that. So I, I, I think that we now, I think we're at a point of the pandemic and we will maintain this going forward where it's no longer the top down recommendation of what to do. This is very much a democratized experience. It's up to us to know what it is we're supposed to do and then to do it ourselves and to ask others to do it as well. Ask politely, don't get in a fight, um, but, but to, to realize that you know what my neighbor does does impact me. Adam, if I could um, just quickly address um, David's comments as well as Emily's questions, I think it's important to add two contextual notes. And that, David, as always, it was a fantastic uh, summary. One is that it's worth reminding people that that orange red category is decided by really serious outcomes, right? So the CDC uses hospital admissions for COVID and the percent of hospital beds that are dedicated to COVID patients. So it's not like they're just counting cases anymore to define the rates or the threat. They do look at that to help figure this out, but they are focusing on the things that could really impact our health system. And so it's worth paying attention, you know, when, when that level is at, um, is at a red or, or, or an orange. And if you look at Alabama today, 15% of our hospital beds have COVID patients. That might not sound like a ton, but in some places, when you look at the, the capacity and you're waiting to get in for an elective surgery or chemotherapy or something or a, a access line, that could be a lot. The other point I wanna remind people is that, you know, vaccines are approved for kids and they work for kids. The uptake has been very low but it is another way you can protect your child. And no one is more expert on this than Dr. Kimberlin um, before you go back to school. All right, thank you. Um, next question is from Ramsey Archibald and I think we'll stick with Dr. Marazzo here. Um, how do you read COVID numbers these days in relation to the widespread availability of at-home tests? Is it possible to compare the current wave to previous ones in terms of case counts and positivity rate? Yeah, Ramsey, that's what I was alluding to before. So thank you for bringing us back to it. Um, it's kind of an epidemiologist nightmare. Um, when you look at, first of all, how are the tests performing in the setting of this current wave? I can't tell you how many people who have had COVID in the last two weeks who have told me that they tested negative on the rapid antigen tests for several days in a row, up to three days before they finally turned positive at four days. And that was during the time that they had symptoms. So not only are you dealing with the fact that not everybody's testing, not everybody's testing when they're symptomatic, they may be just checking to see if they've been exposed and infected. You're also dealing with what I think is probably a reduced performance of the antigen test with the current variant, the BA5 and maybe BA4 too. So all of this makes it very difficult to, um, I think, to 
directly compare the numbers from one wave to another. It's one of the reasons that it has been helpful to look at the hard markers or the hard endpoints, such as hospitalizations um, and percent of hospital beds, and of course, death, which, which we really don't wanna see. That said, when you look at the trajectories of the number of cases over time, um, you know, you're still seeing this pattern that goes like this. And, you know, in, in this wave right now, we're kind of approaching this peak that is pretty similar to what we saw before. My guess is there's more disease out there because we're not reporting as much. But again, people are testing more because tests are much more available. So you almost could swing it any way you want to. I think the hard things to pay attention to are how sick are people um, based on the hospitals. The other thing we aren't talking about is the effect on our workforce. We were just talking here before we started about the number of people on, our, on my faculty, in the hospital, in our clinics who are out because they have COVID. And that's a metric that I really think um, CDC and some other places not, need to start looking at because those are people who are not hospitalized yet are really affecting our ability to do our jobs. So long answer, not sure. Um, really need to look, I think, at a number of metrics to help figure us out, figure out what's going on. Thank you. Uh, next question is for Dr. Kimberlin um, from uh, Jillian Brooks with WBRC. Uh, how is this wave impacting children directly? Also, um, can you talk about the effectiveness of the vaccine for children as it stands now? The vaccine is is highly effective. Um, and, and let me define that. And Dr. Morazzo already touched on this. Uh, if we ask any vaccine that prevents an infection or impacts an infection that is mucosal, in other words, nose, airway, mouth, that kind of, you know, where the mucosa are, not bloodstream, in other words, um, any of those vaccines have a hard time controlling the initial infection. That's, that, that's the nature of a mucosal illness, appears to be anyway. And, and when we first had the vaccine data coming out, you know, at the latter part of 2020, the numbers were so, you know, tremendously good that I think we got a little overconfident. And we started thinking that the vaccine, that this vaccine, COVID vaccine, could do what the other mucosal vaccines could not do, and that is prevent every runny nose. Uh, we now know that that's not the case, but the reason we developed the vaccines to begin with and what we measured then and what we emphasize we're measuring now are is to prevent hospitalizations, severe disease, death. And they do a great job with that, you know, 80, 90%. Uh, protection against severe disease, hospitalization, and death, and that includes in children. So um, the vaccines across the age spectrum, six months through 95 years and beyond, uh, are highly effective at doing what we need for them to do, and that is to prevent severe disease, hospitalization, and death. They will not prevent every runny nose. That's, that's a fact. We all realize that. Um, that also is an exact reason why we need to continue to get as many people vaccinated as possible so that we can keep them out of the hospital and we can keep them alive. Now, children, uh, the, the uptake of, of the vaccine in, in children across the country, and especially in Alabama and Mississippi, is just pitiful. I mean, it really, really is poor. Uh, there's no other way to say it. Uh, we're not having success here. Um, I recommend that parents talk to their pediatrician and their family practice doc about it. And I, and I think what they're going to hear is a strong recommendation that your child be vaccinated. And the vaccination is to prevent the child from having severe disease if they get infected. It is to prevent them, hopefully, from having the long-term sequelae, the long-term outcomes of COVID, known as long COVID, uh, which children are prone to get just as adults are prone to get. Uh, and therefore be able to live healthy and, and, and long lives and not hopefully because they're not getting so sick from it, transmit it to others such as grandparents who might have a harder time uh, with fighting off the virus even if they have had the vaccine and boosters. So we're all in this together, take care of ourselves. That means get vaccinated and boosted. That includes children six months of, it, months of age and over. Trust the vaccines. They're doing what we are asking of them. And we're developing, as Dr. Morazzo said, additional modifications to the vaccine to hopefully make them even more effective. And 
be mindful of the, what we do, not only is protecting ourselves, but it's protecting others, including the loved ones in our families. Thank you so much for that. Um, next question, uh, I imagine Dr. Marazzo, um, are you seeing many cases of reinfection? Yes, seeing lots of cases of reinfection. So seeing lots of people who had COVID before vaccines were available, um, and then have gotten vaccinated, many people who have even gotten boosted and gotten boosted twice and are still getting infected with um, the Omicron BA5 um, variant. So um, there is no doubt that prior infection probably protects against repeat infection to a certain point. But the key point about coronaviruses, and you know this because you've all had common colds, every winter pre-pandemic due to some type of coronavirus is that immunity is not long lasting. We have not figured out how to create immunity just like we can't with influenza that will really last more than six to eight months, maybe a year if you're lucky, but that's really outside. I think six months is really where people feel pretty comfortable. So that means even if you've been boosted, um, you know, that you still, if you, your booster was six months ago, you're probably going to have some waning immunity. On top of that, if you add this vaccine, I'm sorry, this variant strain that has figured out ways to get around the protection from infection, albeit still preventing severe disease, you're definitely going to see reinfections. Now, what we don't know yet is whether reinfections or repeat infections continue to provide almost additive protection, right? So do you get, if you get infected for your second coronavirus, do you get an increase in your antibody levels that is even higher than you made for your first? If you get infected a third time, is that gonna happen? We don't know. And it's confounded by the fact that every new infection is almost certainly with a new variant, right? So you're thinking about all of these factors that are at play but there is no doubt that you can get infected more than once. Thank you. Um, I think we'll stick with you, Dr. Marazzo, on this next question. Um, should immunocompromised groups like pregnant women or, or other immunocompromised groups get a fourth booster? And what is, um, you know, should an immunocompromised person follow the advice of their specific specialist? It's a great question, and I've been getting this question a lot, and I want to sort of probably complicate matters further because I know this is on everybody's mind. Um, the answer is yes. If you have immunocompromised as defined by the CDC, and that does include pregnant women who we know are at more severe risk for COVID-related outcomes, not just them, but their babies, right? So if you look at mortality, neonatal ICU admission, and again, Dr. Kimberlin is the, an expert on this much more than I am, you're going to see that um, bad outcomes much more in women who were not vaccinated, both in the moms and the babies if they get COVID. So if you are immunocompromised, you should get the two boost boosters. Questions I've got from people have to do with, well, I'm due for that second booster. Now it's August. There's going to be another booster that I'm hearing about coming out in September or October. Should I wait? Is there a problem if I get my booster now with the currently available vaccine and the CDC all of a sudden or FDA all of a sudden comes out with a new vaccine in October? CDC, and I just talked with somebody last night about this because a lot of people are worried about getting too many vaccines too close together, which is not an unreasonable fear. Um, so the CDC is saying if you are up to, if you're up, if you're on up at a point where you are um, supposed to get your next booster because you're immunocompromised, go ahead and get it. Don't wait. We never know what's going to happen, right? We don't know what's going to happen with the availability of the next vaccine. And we also know that that second booster does help prevent against the severe infection. It's a nice study just this week out in the Journal of the American Medical Association looking at this very thing in Israeli health care workers showing that that fourth booster does really help in terms of those outcomes. Um, and then see what happens in the fall. So if something comes out in October, come back to us, ask the question, talk to your healthcare provider. Do you think I should get this new vaccine on top of being maximally boost as recently as and whenever that was? So that, that would be my advice. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kimberlin, um, what challenges might we face this school year 
maybe something that may be unforeseen? And how does this school year compare to last as it relates to COVID? Well, it's a great question that would require a crystal ball. Um, and of course, none of us have that. So, so, so take, take my answer uh, with that in mind. I think we're in a better place uh, in, in August 22, 2022 than we were in August 2021, certainly than we were in August of 2020. And we should celebrate that. That's a good thing. Um, I think the, the infections, they're happening a lot because it's a very infectious virus, as Dr. Morazzo has already um, given us uh, examples of. Uh, but it does, in each individual person, um, cause milder symptoms on average. Um, now, that still, you can have so many people getting sick and, and a smaller percentage getting very sick and, and then have stress on the hospital system. But we're not even seeing that as much with, with, the, with the numbers of cases that we're able to count. And then you add on, as the question uh, from Mr. Archibald was earlier uh, alluding to, you add on those that are uncounted uh, because they're home tests. And, and probably we have an awful lot of virus out there that's not causing the, the, the catastrophic kind of overload of the hospital system, at least not yet. Um, so I think we're likely to see a lot of viral spread, uh, you know, certainly as we move into the fall, um, there might be a bit of a lull as people are not as clustered inside, even though you are inside during a class, you know, you're, 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 you're spending a lot of time outdoors. And then as we get more toward winter, where we're all inside again, because it's cold, um, maybe seeing another, another uh, rise in cases at that point. That would be my guess. Um, I think the main risk for children in school right now is, is similar to what Dr. Morazzo was talking about, risk to, to the healthcare systems, and that is the people that work there. Um, if we start having a lot of teachers and principals and custodians and uh, uh, workers in, in uh, cafeterias and so forth going out because they're sick, that's going to put a stress and a pressure on that particular school to be able to maintain the services that they want to provide. That's really not different than was the case in the beginning of the 2021-2022 school season either. So I, I think that that, that kind of a, a, a risk is what we have uh, in store for us coming up. Um, Dr. Kimlin, I'll stay with you for this next question. Um, so there are parents who are worried about side effects of the vaccine, specifically when it comes to fertility or, or puberty and maybe miss C. Um, what do research and studies show about these risks? Uh, there are no risks to fertility. Um, there are none. Uh, the, the study that that was sort of study, uh, and, and I'm using air quotes, um, that that was based on was, was uh, completely invalidated and really was not very valid to begin with. Um, so, so you don't have to worry about that. You just simply don't have to worry about that. Now, MISC, it, which was the tail end of what the question was, that's a different entity. MISC is a post-infection hyperinflammatory syndrome that children get, post-infection hyperinflammatory syndrome. Vaccination decreases the likelihood of MISC. Vaccination decreases the likelihood of long COVID. Vaccination decreases the likelihood of, of uh, severe hospitalization, uh, severe disease hospitalization and death. Vaccines are the way through this. Uh, right now, there, there were data out of CDC a number of months ago now that 75% of American children had been, had been infected with COVID. As Dr. Morazzo said, reinfections will happen. How do we best protect ourselves? Because reinfection can still result in long COVID. It can still result in uh, severe disease, hospitalization, and death. How can we best prevent that? by getting vaccinated and, and, and by setting, a, these are very safe vaccines. They will cause a sore arm. They will cause a sore arm. They may cause a little bit of low grade fever for 12 hours or something. These are well tolerated, well developed vaccines but they only work when they go in somebody's arm. Great, thank you. Um, Morgan Hightower, you have your hand raised, go ahead. Okay, hi, Dr. Kimberlin and Dr. Morazzo. It's nice to hear from y'all this morning. Um, I just have a question for Dr. Morazzo about who should be getting tested for COVID right now. I know that the symptoms of BA5 are less severe. So how do you know if you have just a runny nose versus you have this potentially infectious virus? Yeah, that's a great question, Morgan. Um, and thanks for being here and for your question. Uh, you know, I would say that given how much um, COVID is 
currently apparently responsible for the respiratory infections we are seeing. You know, it's the middle of the summer. It's not really the season where we see the winter cold viruses, although we do see some respiratory uh, viruses that aren't COVID in the summer. Just that I would say almost everybody who has symptoms consistent with a suspected COVID case turns out to have COVID, right? It's, a, it's sort of like the prior likelihood of positivity is very high. So I would say um, if you have any symptoms of a respiratory infection from a runny nose, sinus, sinus congestion, I, rem, I, me, I mentioned the sore throat in particular, the th throat can be a really big problem. I would go ahead and test. You may not be sick enough or have some of the indications to take Paxlovid, so that may not be why you're testing. The real reason you're testing, as Dr. Kimberlin alluded to so eloquently, is so you can protect your family and your contacts. And you can say, okay, I have COVID, I am highly infectious at this time, I'm gonna work from home or I'm not gonna work and I'm gonna stay home. So I would say have a very low threshold for testing if you have any symptoms that you're concerned about. The tests are relatively affordable and also people aren't taking advantage of the free tests. You can get a lot of free tests from the federal government and, and we might wanna sort of publicize that a bit more because I think you can get up to eight tests or something and they just keep coming in the mail. So test yourself liberally and mostly not just to sort of track your symptoms and your need for possible intervention over the next subsequent days, but really to understand how best to keep those around you safe. If you don't have any symptoms, when, when should you test? There's another great question. Personally, I know people have been doing this when they've been exposed to somebody who has COVID and they have concerns about catching it early so that they're not infectious. So the other thing is, say you're going on a big vacation, you're going on your big Alaska cruise, right? In a week, you're exposed to somebody who has COVID, you're freaking out because you really don't want to, you know, get on the cruise and get COVID when you're on your cruise. You may want to test after exposure beforehand to know that it's safe. So again, I would say test liberally, just recognize that the test performance is not perfect especially with this virus. And as I mentioned, even with symptoms, you might have a negative result when you truly do have COVID. So I hope that's helpful. Thank you, Dr. Marat. So I think we'll stick with you for this next question. Um, that may be of interest to a lot of people. What, are, uh, what types of symptoms are you seeing in uh, COVID long haulers? Um, and how does it compare or to previous long haulers? And this may be a, another opportunity to mention the RECOVER study. Sure. So um, it is a really, it is a billion dollar question. And the related question is, um, number one, does vaccine help mitigate the likelihood of long COVID? And number two, are we going to see as much long COVID with this new variant and with Omicron in general? And as Adam mentioned, we have a very large study going on. If you've had COVID recently or you think you have long COVID, we would love to hear from you. It's called the Recover Study, and we can talk about that later. The symptoms that we see most frequently um, are really long-term fatigue, almost like a chronic fatigue syndrome. Sometimes people have brain fog. They just do not feel like their um, sort of intellectual reasoning and capacity is just quite as quick as it usually is. And sometimes that goes on for weeks, even months after the COVID infection. Um, chronic cough uh, is a big one. Some people have had hearing loss. I think that's probably more likely from early on, uh, the sense of smell. So all those things that we talked about, I'm not seeing, and I don't think we're hearing that the symptoms associated with the current presentations of long COVID are different than early on. Um, I think the fatigue, the cough, the brain fog are still the really big ones. There are some encouraging studies. There was just a study this week published about a very small early study of a new agent that might help treat long COVID, probably targeting some of the inflammation that we think is going on with long COVID. It's sort of a persistent overreaction to the virus, um, but we still are really having a lot of challenges managing it. I don't think it's more common um, certainly um, with Omicron, again, this is just very impressionistic data. And we do have data to support that people who are vaccinated, even if they get COVID, are less likely to get long COVID. And that's probably because the prior vaccine status confers some modification of 
what happens when the virus is trying to cause the symptoms of long, long COVID. So again, come back to, you know, if you want to try to protect yourself from all the things that COVID can do, vaccination is probably, uh, probably the most potent, but a lot to learn about long COVID. And just yesterday, the White House um, released a very big research plan for this and is really putting a lot of resources into this. Um, so we're happy to be part of it, but we have a long way to go. Thank you. Uh, Morgan, do you have another question? Yes, thank you. This is for Dr. Kimberlin and it's switching gears from COVID, if, if that's okay. Um, just because we're seeing monkeypox a lot in the news right now, and especially because a fifth child has been diagnosed in the U.S., some parents might be concerned about this and the threat level as they're sending kids back to school. Uh, can you kind of help parents gauge how they should be reacting to this and um, just thoughts on, on the spread of this in young children right now? Well, it, it, it's, I think we're all a bit twitchy. <laughs> Um, uh, with, with yet another um, funny named uh, disease uh, that we're hearing so much about. I really do not think that, that parents have to be concerned about monkeypox in their children. Uh, you know, the, the, the cases that I'm aware of, and literally it's like one hand maybe moving a little bit into the second hand, uh, across the entire country, which is an entire continent uh, of pediatric cases of monkeypox, um, are, are, are household exposures. Uh, and, and so I think the bigger question is gonna be for pediatricians and family practice doctors to, to kind of have a threshold of when do they start looking for it? When do they start thinking about monkeypox as compared with all the other viruses um, uh, or bacteria that can cause uh, a blistering kind of or pustular kind of skin lesions? I, I am, I, I, monkeypox is a, is a real issue. Dr. Morazzo is much better positioned to be able to talk with me about, uh, talk about that with y'all than I am. From the standpoint of currently pediatric uh, concern for monkeypox, it is low on my list. And I would not have parents be worried about that. Um, I, I think that, that the talk, the conversation ought to be in the adults who are the ones that are, you know, accounting for 99 plus percent of cases. All right, thank you. Um, Dr. Marazzo, you mentioned PAX a little bit earlier um, in our discussion. Um, can you talk about uh, who needs to take PAX a bit or how severe should symptoms be before taking PAX a bit? Sure, it's really a decision that is worth talking over uh, with whoever is taking care of you, your care provider, your physician or, or whoever. Um, I think that people who are at risk for more severe COVID, it's kind of a no-brainer. Um, when you look at those categories, most of which we've held pretty constant since early in the pandemic, it includes older people, so people older than 60, those with comorbidities, uh, particularly diabetes, hypertension, cancer, that sort of thing, pulmonary disease, right? chronic kidney disease on dialysis. So those are all people that I would very much support taking Paxlovid. When you start looking at somebody who's relatively young and healthy, um, it becomes more of an individual decision. And it, you think about this in terms of risks and benefits. The benefits are that it probably is going to blunt the severity of your symptoms. So I would definitely look at how sick you are. People I've talked to are like 32 who have temperatures to 104 and rigors and chills. They should have Paxlovid, right? They feel miserable. They can't sleep. There's no reason to say, well, you're only 30. Um, you, could, you should get through this. Um, so I, I think, again, you can be pretty liberal with it because it probably does help. Um, the Benefit, the risk part of Paxlovid is actually, it's a pretty safe drug. You have to be careful to make sure you know what medications you're taking. For example, some transplant patients are on a drug that should not be mixed with Paxlovid. So please don't just take it without talking to somebody and getting a good assessment of what that risk is. The other thing is that it tastes pretty bad. People actually, I talked to one person who lost, lost three pounds in five days from taking Paxlovid because really just could not manage to eat anything. So it does have a bad taste, creates a bad taste in your mouth. So it's not exactly a picnic um, in that regard, not like taking you know Tylenol or, or anything like that. So again, it's an individual decision for most people. Um, few downsides, taste is an issue. 
be sure that there are no what we call contraindications to taking it based on your medication profile or other things. Thank you. Um, I think our last question, uh, and you kind of alluded to uh, winter months, um, flu season is coming up in a couple of months. Uh, how does that factor into getting vaccinated for COVID or boosted? Um, is that even more important as we head into that season? So I can just address that real quick. Uh, Dr. Kimberlin may want to may want to say something too. Um, I think they're true, true, and in some ways unrelated, but there's also potential synergy. So remember, one big thing we feared was a confluence of a flu um, epidemic and a COVID surge. And we were really worried about people who might get both infections around the same time, especially people who are pregnant or immunocompromised. Influenza, very bad in pregnancy, right? You really, really want pregnant women to get vaccinated against flu. So. Um, I still think that everything you can do to protect yourself against each of these viruses is hopefully going to be synergistic and protect not only individuals, but also um, our communities at large. There should be no issue with the vaccines being given close together. Last year, some people got them on the same day. Um, it wasn't a particularly happy next couple of days because the vaccines were strong. And as you know, uh, the, especially the first round of COVID vaccines were, were, pretty, um, were pretty rough days for some people, not everybody. Um, but I think that the key thing is gonna be uh, stay aware of what the flu situation is when the vaccine becomes available. That's usually in September, October, what it's gonna look like. Um, get your flu vaccine. There's no reason not to get it. No, no nothing about what I think will happen with the um, a reissuing of an Omicron vaccine or a, 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 a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine should really change that. So just get vaccinated um, if you can when things are available. Dr. Kimberlin, did you have, have anything to add? I, I agree with that. Um, I, I do think over time, and this is again kind of a crystal ball kind of look, but I, I do think over time we're going to we're going to move away from how many boosters have you had and we're going to move into more of a terminology of an annual COVID shot like we have an annual flu shot the challenge right now is we don't really we, we know what the influenza seasonality is we know what months are more likely to have a, a lot of flu we don't yet know that with COVID I, I, if anything it's looking like it's summertime in the south and and wintertime in the north with some cases in the south as well in the wintertime but whether that holds over time as more and more people get more and more hopeful vaccines and, and additional doses or infected or both, um, maybe that's going to change over time. And this becomes what, what we expected to begin with, which was that it would be a wintertime uh, illness. Whenever we know what that seasonality is with greater specificity, able to ability to predict, then we're going to start talking about get your, your COVID shot before that. Uh, and I think that'll that just that change that shift in the terminology will will be better than I'm getting my my second booster, my fourth dose, and I do for a third booster, fifth dose. It it, it gets confusing, uh, and, and I think we're beyond we're we're not there yet, but we're moving toward the point of being beyond and being able to talk about it more in terms of what do you need for this year to maximally protect yourself and protect your family. Great. Well, I think that's a, a great way to end today's uh, Q&A. Dr. Kimlin, Dr. Marazzo, thank you so much for your time today. And for the media, a reminder, we will send out a recording. It may take a, a few minutes to get that process, but we will send that out to you shortly. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Wow.